Good morning. Welcome to Mount Zion this morning. If you'll stand, we are going to open the service this morning. We're going to sing about the victory that we have in Jesus
are several things that you can see online that that uh, that are available, and I think it's a good thing that we should take advantage of. As part of that, though, um, Pastor Mark will be putting up the devotional and midweek stuff that he normally does because, well, he'll be busy at the at the summit. The uh, don't forget, we're still taking up offering for West Africa. We'll have an offering plate in the back so you can put your offering, special offering in that, and that'll go to, to help offset some of the costs that the, that the Yeomans have for, for moving and, and getting things started over in uh, a different country. The uh, other things that we need to look at is the back to school event that's going to be on the 31st. On Thursday, the 29th at 6.30, this, we're going to have kind of a meeting to make sure that we have everything ready. So if you're involved and, and that make sure you come at 6:30 on the 30 or on the 29th Thursday, and so we can make sure we have everything ready and ready to go on all that. And Dana already gave me a sheet of all these kids that need rides and all that. So we have a, we already have a big start here of the people that are going to be uh, be at the event. So um, be praying about this. Be thinking about how you can help. If you haven't been asked, make sure you just approach somebody. Or just let somebody know that you're willing to help. And like I said before, you can always come and eat and, and have a good time and talk to folks. So uh, as part of that, Patty asked me to announce that, that we don't need side dishes. We need desserts. And also they're going to do a cakewalk, so they need some cakes. So cakes for a cakewalk and desserts for people to eat on, on Saturday or what we're going to need. So make sure you do that. And Dana. Uh, it doesn't actually have to be cakes. So if you have questions about about this cakewalk or anything like that, see Dana. Or if you want to help with games or anything, see Dana. If you want to talk, want to talk just straight food, talk to Patty. Because Patty will talk about food with you. So the other things that we need to, to look at is, uh, the, once again, to uh, the most, there's a, a little blurb in there about the tractor drive that Brian did. That he raised, uh, raised about $1,000 towards the shipping for a the shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. So he will give everybody drives. Well, look at that track. Yeah, look at that track. Yeah. Okay, another thing that's coming up on August 6th is, is a movie night. And if you have any questions about that, you can see Dana. She can tell you about that. But that'll be kind of like our last fling, kids, before you got to start school. It's hard to believe school starts the 10th of August. So uh, that'll be on the 6th, and uh, of course Solar Entry will be starting up that weekend, and Right Path Ministries will be starting up the following week. So be thinking about those things, and um, the, if you have any other announcements or anything that need to get out, make sure that you contact Sarah, and she can get them in the bulletin, or get them, we can get them out as a, as a one call or a, on text to church. Go ahead. Okay. If you would stand, let's open prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house and for who you are. Lord, we just ask that you continue throughout this week. Keep us all safe. Help us to, to, to be your servants and do your will. Lord, we just ask you to be with Brother Mike today and throughout this week. And uh, we ask your blessing upon him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and you're going to do what? You're going to listen fast. You're learning. Uh, uh, we, we have a guest with us today. I am so glad uh, to have Kay Riddle with us today. Uh, he was a part of our church family at uh, uh, Center Point, and he came and spent the weekend with Kathy and I. He found out how boring lives can be with two senior adults. And so, uh, so anyway, we had a great time with Kay this weekend, and so glad that he is here. Uh, again, take your Bibles. This is the second sermon in a series about Jonah. Uh, it's actually part two of last week's sermon. And uh, I have been doing a series about some characters in the Bible. You know, uh, those guys from, that went from being zeros to heroes. And so today, I'm going to talk to you about the lawn chair prophet. And a lot of you are thinking, what on earth could I mean by that? So, before we even get to our scripture, and I'm going to begin in Jonah chapter 2. So I wanted you to be aware of where I'm going to be. I've got to ask you a couple of questions. I want you to be thinking about this as we move into this lesson for today, okay? Very basic question. How's your prayer life? Alright, think about it right now. I, I, I mean, I'm serious. How's your prayer life? Is it routine? Now, I, to be honest with you, if you have a routine prayer life, there's something good about that and there's something bad about that. Okay? It's good that you have a routine prayer life. It's good that you can be counted on to pray. But if it is so routine that there's no feeling to it, no emotion to it, that could be a bad thing. So, how is your prayer life? Is it routine? Is it mechanical? You find yourself saying just the same old thing every time. Mm -hmm. Is it one-sided? I mean, are you the only one doing talking at prayer time? Now, some of you are saying, you know, please don't tell me that God talks to you out loud. No, He doesn't talk to me out loud. But sometimes He almost does, and sometimes He almost makes me believe He could. And, and, and you know, there's a part of prayer that after we get done saying our piece, that we meditate for a little while because God might be speaking to our hearts about something. So, one more question about your prayer life. Do you talk only to God in emergency mode? Whenever you pray, do you have this relationship with Him or every time do you pray, do you find yourself in emergency mode? You know what I mean, don't you? That, that you're only going, God, I need this, and I, and, I, and I need this, and I need this, and I need it now. And, and you're in this emergency. Now, what does that have to do with our lesson for today? Well, I'm talking to you about the prophet Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. But you already know that. Jonah, at one time, had possessed a prayer life with God. Because the Bible says in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, that Jonah, that God spoke to Jonah. So if God is speaking to you, it means you have a prayer life of some kind, right? So we read that God speaks to Jonah. And later on in that same chapter, Jonah admits that he heard God speak. Pretty cool. But the problem is, even though Jonah heard God speak, Jonah did the exact opposite of what God had told him to do, what God had asked him to do. In Jonah chapter 1, after Jonah heard the word of the Lord in his prayer time, he quit talking to God. He heard something he didn't want to hear. So he quit talking to God. And instead, he ran in the opposite direction. He traveled in the opposite direction, hoping to get away from God. You'll remember that in last week's sermon. God called Jonah to go over to the area of Nineveh in the land of the Assyrians to preach a message of repentance. Jonah didn't like those folks. 
They were his enemies. He didn't care for them at all. And it may have been a danger thing for Jonah. Maybe Jonah didn't want to go over there at the risk of being jailed or killed or, or, or whatever. But the bottom line is he went and got a ticket on a boat to Tarshish, which was the farthest place that you could get a ticket for from Java. He was sailing out of the port at Java, and he got a ticket for the place that was farthest away from where God told him to go. So he was hoping. In his mind, he wanted to get away from God. So, are you ready for this? I mean, you know i got to ask it. Have you ever wanted to get away from God? I, I mean, be honest with me now. There are a lot of you that, that maybe you have come to the point in your relationship that, that we realize that our days could be fewer numbered than they once were, you know. And, and, and so because of that, we don't want away from God. We want Him close by, but we don't want Him too close. But there may have been some of you that in some point in your life, you went through a situation that given to yourself and left to yourself, you really kind of wanted to get away from God. And that's where Jonah was. He had stopped praying, hoping he could get away from God. So notice this. He buys a ticket far away from where God told him to go, thinking that God would only be in Nineveh. So he gets a ticket as far away from God as he could. And then he thought, I'll stop praying. Because if I stop praying, I'll feel away from God. I won't feel God's presence anymore. He gets on that boat and a storm came. And Jonah still wanted to get away from God. I believe that Jonah went down in the hull of the ship because he knew God was in the storm. So he goes into the bottom of the boat and he has this hope of sleeping his worries away. I haven't even gotten to today's scripture yet. And I already know that I'm about to strike a nerve right now. When was the last time, and I know you've done this, that you were depressed enough that you tried to sleep your worries away? Am I right? You think, if I can just lay back here for a minute and just not think of anything. You know, the very times that we need to go to God is the times that we try to shut him out. So Jonah finally managed to get to sleep and he thought, if I can get to sleep, I'll stop hearing God. I won't hear him in that storm. So Jonah makes it to sleep, but then the storm was so bad, did it wake Jonah up? No. The storm was so bad, though, that the crew of the ship went down there with Jonah, and the crew woke him up. What did they say to him? They said, we heard you're a preacher. Pray to your God. They said, we're in a mess here. This boat is about to crumble. Pray to your God. Our gods aren't answering. You pray to your God, maybe your God will answer. So up to this point, there had been no praying from Jonah. But Jonah knew enough about God that he knew God was in the storm. And he told the crew of the ship that God was in the storm. And he said, if you'll just throw me overboard, you'll be okay. Now, I don't think, I don't think that Jonah was thinking, if I land in this water, God's going to send a fish to save me. He wasn't thinking that at all. Jonah was thinking the judgment of God is coming anyway, and it's coming for me. I need to stop involving these other guys in this boat. That's what Jonah was thinking. Jonah was thinking, 
I need to be the one who faces the judgment of God for my sins. And so he asked the crew to throw him into the sea. Somehow this was Jonah's last ditch suicidal effort to get away from God. But the Bible says that God sent a great fish not only to swallow Jonah, but to hold Jonah inside for three days and three nights. Don't forget that. He told, uh, he was going to hold Jonah in the fish for three days and three nights. That's really significant. Then we read the text for today in Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Notice what God's word says. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. So now he's praying, right? From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And Lord, you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea. About, and, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. So here he's praying, and Jonah already knows. Jonah has already heard from God, and he makes this statement, I'm going to see your holy temple again. So he's already sensing God is answering his prayer. So it goes on, verse 5, The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Even seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, you brought my life up from the pit. So Jonah is saying, God, you're not done with me. Now, Many times we have asked the question, Lord, I don't get what's going on. Are you finished with me? I, I, I don't feel your blessing. I don't feel your touch in my life. Are you done with me? But what amazes me is what Jonah experienced. Things sure looked different for Jonah from the inside of the belly of the whale. Jonah had said no to God in broad daylight. And Jonah's consequences of saying no to God were very costly. Jonah had even tried to run away from God. And whenever the storms came, Jonah was thrown into the depths of the sea. But notice this. This takes us to our first point today. It was in the belly of the whale that Jonah found his peace with God. You like my graphic? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I had to find on the internet, I had to find a happy whale. Because the whale was carrying God's messenger and he was happy about it. And it was in the belly of the whale that Jonah found his peace with God. I can't say that enough. Now, scientists will tell you that in the eye of a hurricane, it is peaceful. But if you're in the eye of a hurricane, you're in trouble. Right? If you're in the eye of a hurricane, Serious danger is swirling nearby. And it doesn't take a scientist to tell me that there's danger swirling all around us in our world today. Jonah knew about the danger in Nineveh. That's why he didn't want to go there. Jonah knew how much the Assyrians hated his people. Before the whale had swallowed Jonah, Jonah 
even knew about the storm. Before Jonah was thrown into the sea, he saw the winds and the waves out on the sea. But in the belly of the whale, it's very clear he was at peace. In the belly of a whale, he found peace. How? Because it was in the belly of the whale that he experienced the presence of God and the will of God. And he experienced the presence and the will of God up close and personal. It was in the belly of the whale that Jonah repented for his rebellion against God's will. So the storm was still all around him. He was in the depths of the sea, even had seaweed wrapped around his head. It was in the belly of the whale that he realized that he had failed God. Jonah's answer was found within the will of God, and in that moment, when Jonah was in the belly of the whale, Jonah knew he was in the will of God there. Jonah may have broken the will of God himself, but he knew he was within the realm of God's providence. So Jonah's peace was experienced within the will of God, even if it was in the belly of the whale. I want to tell you today, if you are going through some trying times, sometimes it's in those trying times, in the middle of your storm, that if you're where you would ought to be in your prayer life with God, that could be some of the most peaceful times of your life. It can be some of the most peaceful times in your life. And that takes me to point number two today. Then God took Jonah back to the place of disobedience and he gave Jonah another chance. Now by back to the place of, of uh, disobedience, I want to remind you Nineveh was not a port city. And so the whale could only take him as far as Joppa, back to the place where Nineveh had disobeyed God and had gone in the other direction. So notice chapter 3, verse 1. Whenever the whale, after the whale, had vomited Jonah out on dry ground, it says in chapter 3, verse 1, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Notice verse 5 at the beginning of it. The Ninevites believed God. The Ninevites believed God and a fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Now, I want to remind you, in their culture in that day, if you put on sackcloth, it means that you were sorrowful about something. And they were sorry that they had sinned against God. Let's back up to Jonah, just for a second. Jonah's disobedience had caused the storms in his life. Jonah's disobedience had caused the waves to rock his boat. Jonah's disobedience caused him to get swallowed up by his life. And unfortunately, that happens to a lot of us today. Our disobedience will bring storms into our lives. Our disobedience will create waves that will rock our boat. Our disobedience will cause us to become so overwhelmed that we just feel gobbled up and swallowed up by life. We don't enjoy life the way we once did. So when we refuse to listen, whenever we refuse to obey, whenever we refuse to turn to God, 
God has to allow a storm to come our way to get our attention. You see, inevitably, without God directing our lives, we're soon going to find ourselves in a situation where we feel hopeless, where we feel helpless, where we feel trapped. Do you ever feel trapped by a situation in your life? I want to remind you that whenever you feel swallowed up by life, God is there. When you feel swallowed up by life, where do you look for God? Let me tell you where to look for Him. Look for Him in the eye of the storm because He's there. Look for Him in the eye of the storm. In the center of the storm where there is peace, God is there. When God gave Jonah another chance, the Bible says he took advantage of it. He headed straight for Nineveh. Once he got there, he walked a full day. The Bible says it took him, it would take a person three days to walk from one end of the city to the other. But whenever Jonah got there, he walked for one full day through the city and he was telling them that their city would be destroyed. They would be overthrown by another nation if they did not repent to God. Now, the essence of Jonah's sermon, because he kept walking, I can assure you that the essence of his sermon was shorter than mine here today. He kept saying the same thing over and over. He kept telling the one simple message that God told him to tell while he was walking through the city of Nineveh. They would be destroyed in 40 days if they did not repent and turn to the one God, Jehovah. Jonah's sermon wasn't very deep. It wasn't anything he needed to explain. But the good news was that the people of Nineveh, they had 40 days. They had 40 days to reverse their situation because God had not sent judgment yet and He was offering them time to repent. Like I said, it would have taken Jonah three days to walk from one end of Nineveh to the other. But news travels fast. The Bible indicates that in chapter 3, verse 5, that even on the first day, the people of Nineveh believed God. Whenever they heard the message of Jonah, they declared a fast, all of them. Now, what does that mean, they declared a fast? It means that they became so urgent about what their problem was that they became uninterested in food and interested in prayer. So prayer suddenly became their life source. Prayer suddenly became their food. The Bible says it was all of them. The Bible goes on and says that even the king gave orders for the people. He told the people to figure out how to make their animals kneel down so that God would know that all of them were serious. Now that sounds crazy, but it sounds like a king who wanted to make sure he got it right. Maybe he didn't understand all of it, so he told the people of Nineveh, uh, of Nineveh he said, listen, all of us have to be bowing down. We want everybody to be spared. We even want our livestock to be spared. I, I don't know how you do it. I know the animals can't pray to God, but get them down on their knees too. Somehow, God saw that the king and the people of Nineveh were serious. Which takes me to the third point today. Although Jonah had been given a second chance, Jonah did not want the same courtesy extended to Nineveh. He didn't want God to forgive Nineveh. And, and so since Jonah didn't really want God to forgive Nineveh, he went and preached to Nineveh because he saw the consequences of what happened when he didn't. But Jonah didn't want 
Nineveh to be forgiven. He wanted God to execute judgment against them. The Ninevites, they were from the empire of the Assyrians. They were enemies of the Jews. Jonah didn't want his enemies to survive. Jonah did not want God's grace extended to the people of Nineveh. Jonah didn't think they deserved it. Which brings me to another question. Have you ever known of somebody who didn't want somebody else to get right with God? Have you ever known of somebody and that person thought, you know what? I can't stand that person. I hope they go to hell. There was a time that I'm sure that that was said by church people about Adolf Hitler. Or Saddam Hussein. Those names would have come to mind in the minds of some people. But maybe you have a personal enemy today. You know, that person who, if they got right with God, somewhere, someday, you were going to have to call them your brother or sister in Christ. <laughs> and you don't really, really want to do that. That's how John felt. That, that's what Jonah was going through. How do I know? Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now, it, it's just said in, at the end of chapter 3 that the people repented. Every one of them. Alright? In verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Jonah didn't like the idea that people were repenting. And he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord. Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord? Whenever I was still at home, this is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew, God, I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, that you were slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents by sending calamity, uh, relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Now, this may sound like a sidetrack. Maybe it is. How many backseat drivers do we have here today? Do we have any backseat drivers? Have you ever been guilty of spouting instructions to the driver from the passenger seat? My 15-year-old granddaughter, she has her learner's permit. On a recent trip here to Indiana, she got this bright idea that she could drive my car. I didn't give her that idea. Of course, she meant, you know, drive it, pop with you. Or drive it with Nana. You know, with us being her passenger side. You know what? I haven't signed up for this. I haven't signed up for that. I've already raised my kids. I taught my own teens how to drive. But how do you say no <coughs> to your pretty little granddaughter who's growing up faster than you could ever imagine. So I said, okay. Actually, things went pretty well. She actually drove Kathy or me around town a lot that week. It was our week of vacation Bible school. She told both of us that she liked driving with us in the car because we didn't yell at her. Now, but as a dad, you know, we didn't yell at her. But as a dad, when I was teaching my own kids how to drive, I, I did some yelling. And to be honest with you, I wanted to have my foot on the accelerator 
the other foot on the brake, and truth be told, while I was teaching them how to drive, I wanted to be the one sitting behind the steering wheel. So why have I told you this story today? What's the point that I want to make with this particular story? There are times when many of us, we do not want God in the driver's seat of our lives. There are those of us right here, we really don't want God making the turns in our lives that should be made. We don't want God to step on the gas when we don't want to go faster. We don't want God to speed up to a new level of responsibility. We don't want God putting on the brakes to something that's spiritually unhealthy for us, something that we're determined to do. And getting back to that backseat driver analogy, I almost can't say this, but this is true. Sometimes we'd like to give God some directions of his own. Just like Jonah. Sometimes we would like to give God some directions and let him know how we would do things if we were God. That's exactly what happened in Jonah 4. That's why I call Jonah the lawn chair prophet. Because he tried to just sit back and watch God respond. He tried to just sit back and watch God respond to the sermon he had preached in Nineveh. So quickly, before we run out of time, let's look at verse 5. Now, after he's already complained to God, right? He's prayed to God and he's complained. So then the Bible says, Jonah had gone out and he had sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. So now I want you to understand, Jonah had helped God out by going and preaching destruction and judgment to Nineveh. And so he goes out to the east side of town, gets himself a lawn chair, puts up a shelter or an umbrella, and he sits underneath on his lawn chair, underneath his shade, and he watches to see how good his sermon really was. And he waits for the city of Nineveh to be destroyed. He's going to sit there for 40 days, given the chance. Mm. Do you not have a problem with that? And I have a problem with that. There are too many of us Christians who have become lawn chair Christians. We're just sitting back watching and waiting for our world to dissolve right before our eyes. We make sure that we're in the shelter of God's fold, but that's it. And then sometimes God will even send some additional comfort our way to remind us of His presence. Look at verse 6. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant, and he made it grow up over Jonah to give extra shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. So notice, Jonah's happy about this newfound blessing from God. Verse 7, but at dawn the next morning, God provided a worm which chewed up the plant so that it withered. And whenever the sun rose the next day, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Now, Jonah hadn't planted the plant. God had given a temporary blessing. And now whenever that blessing was gone, Jonah's complaining as if God had done something wrong. Sometimes God will send additional comfort our way to remind us of His presence, but then at other times, God may send a worm to eat up our blessings because we have become ungrateful. 
But God has a plan. I want to remind you, He forgave the people of Nineveh because they repented. God has a plan. And if we will align ourselves with God's plan, we will feel God's blessing even if we are living in the eye of the storm. If we align ourselves with God's plan, we will experience His grace and His mercy day by day. You cannot expect to be a recipient of God's grace while at the same time you refuse to be a giver of God's grace to others. You remember the Lord's Prayer? The disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus taught them how to pray. And in the middle of that prayer, he said, Forgive us our debtors as we forgive, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our sins according to the way that we forgive other people of their sins. That's what Jesus was teaching. That's a tall order, isn't it? God, please forgive me, but only forgive me as far as I'm willing to forgive other people. Wow. If you're not willing to give grace, you won't be able to receive grace. You can't say to God, God be good to me, but don't expect me to be good to anyone else. Which brings me to my fourth and final point here today. Jonah's story does not end with the book of Jonah. The conclusion of Jonah's story is found several books later in the New Testament. Jesus had just delivered a man who was possessed by demons. And the Pharisees somehow were not satisfied with Jesus' miracle. They wanted more. They wanted a sign. They insisted that if Jesus was really the Son of God, prove it. Prove it who you say you are. In Matthew 12, beginning in verse 38, this is Jesus' response to the Pharisees when they want to sign. Then some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to Jesus, Te Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. So this miracle wasn't enough. Jesus answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. So a wicked and an adulterous generation asks for yet another sign. But none will be given unto it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment and with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now someone greater than Jonah is here. So, Jesus said, now someone greater than the prophet Jonah is here. Who was he talking about? He was talking about himself, that's right. He was talking about himself. And so they said, if you're really the Son of God, prove it. And Jesus said, okay, I'm going to give you one more sign, and it's the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, I'm going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and I'm going to rise again on Easter morning, on resurrection morning, and then that will be the proof that I'm the Son of God. Why would Jesus go to the cross? Why would Jesus be buried and then raised on the third day? And the answer is simple. If you another chance. To give you and to give me another chance. To give you and me a chance to reset our compass and go in the direction 
that God has called us to go. Today, if God is speaking to your heart, maybe there's somebody here today and, and, and you're realizing, hey, I'm not a Christian and I've not said yes to God, but I want to today. Or, or maybe there are some of you that you realize that you've gotten off that path and you're not praying to God anymore and, and, and you really want to sense and experience His presence and His forgiveness. While we're singing this song of invitation, this song of commitment, if you feel a need to pray about your sins, I would consider it an honor and a privilege to be able to support you and pray with you today. Would you stand with me today? And if you have a need in your heart for prayer, would you join me down here at the altar place? And let's lay a fresh sacrifice to God. If you have a need, won't you come? Won't you come?